All right, so we've been talking about current, basically, and a little bit just kind of force balances. Now we're going to change pace for a while and start talking about waves. So um, for the final paper, there are two topics. One will be to talk about the meridional overturning circulation, which is we've been talking about gyres that go this way. Meridional overturning goes this way, or if you like, the vorticity axis is horizontal rather than vertical. Um, but the other topic for chapter for the fourth paper is to take on some topic of waves, and you might wonder why waves are part of a class on climate, but there are actually very very large waves, and that are that occur on relatively slow time scales in a rotating stratified system. And so those waves manifest as climate variability like El Nino. And so we're going to do the basics of waves in general, talk about the more familiar kinds of waves that you've seen at the beach, either in training sediment or just spraying along like that. Or the, this is the, the infamous slurpy waves. Did you? <laughs> so that's not actually frozen solid. It is covered in very fine ice, but it, the wave is still moving. It's not, it, it didn't like freeze in place. It wasn't that cold. It's cold enough that it's got, but you know, there's no spray. And so we'll, we'll start to think about this kind of wave to get our, our feet wet. And then we'll, from this kind of wave, we will then proceed on to think about larger scale waves, which then will contact back ideas like the Rossby radius, rotation, stratification, reduced gravity models, which all are features of these large scale waves. And so over this week and a bit into next week, we'll, we'll move along on those pieces for a bit. Then we'll, then we'll be finished with waves, essentially. We'll come back to meridional overturning circulation. And then there are a few topics. I want to talk to you guys a little bit about the IPCC and what the climate change in the ocean looks like at the end. And so we'll have a sense of how that goes. And that will touch on all the pieces over the whole semester when we get there. Does that make sense? So we're doing a little bit of a switch of pace, but this will be fun. OK. So the topic today are, what is a wave? <laughs> Which we will, for, so that's the first thing. Um, then we're going to remind ourselves about inertial oscillations, which was the closest thing we've talked about so far that's like a wave. And then we're going to talk about the difference between dispersive and non-dispersive waves, which is really which is unfamiliar to people who have seen waves in physics. So that's not part of the electromagnetic wave description. So this is, but it's really important for geophysical waves. Most geophysical waves are dispersive, whereas um, light is non-dispersive. And so a few of the ideas we have about waves from other physics classes need to be adjusted. And that'll come into the concept of a group velocity versus a phase velocity. We'll start to get a sense of that. And then we'll start, just today we'll touch a little bit on the effects of rotation on waves. Obviously, inertial oscillations involve rotation. But what does it do on other kinds of waves? OK, so what is a wave? What do you, what do you uh, what's the difference between a wave and a current? Could be, might not be periodic. There's one key distinction. I'll tell you guys this story now. So I was once teaching about waves in a big lecture class, and I, was about, and I did what I was about to do. Video cable, but I did it with a phone cord. They had a phone on the wall to um, to call for emergencies <laughs> if you had something went wrong with the AV. And so I picked up the phone and then started using the phone cord to illustrate things with waves. And then someone said, hello, on the phone. <laughs> it was very disruptive. But anyway, we'll use this if I can get out. They're all tied up. I want a cord. I'll tell you the cord. Oh, yes, it work. All right, so I can make waves in this Ethernet cable like this. And so if I do it just right, it actually doesn't propagate. It just is stationary. But it's still a wave, right? 
and act sensible the way it is, or I can make it where it travels like that. And so some kind of signal goes from my hand that way. But the cable itself does not leave my hand and go that way. So the key distinction, or a key distinction that we're going to talk about is the difference between a current which transports something from one place to another by carrying the fluid with it versus a wave which transports something from place to place without moving the underlying fluid. So a wave goes like this, but a current goes like that, right? <laughs> okay, so that's, what, that's a key piece we're gonna come on. And then aspects of waves like sinusoids, repeating oscillation are actually more specific. Only certain kinds of waves have those pieces because a wave could just be any signal that propagates from one place to another. And I have a couple of examples that'll make that a little more clear. Okay, so waves are, waves are not the crests. The crest of the wave is the high part. The trough of the wave is the low part. But the high part is not the wave. The wave is the signal. The signal might have a crest. It might have a trough. It might have both. It might be a, a long series of both. But it's just a propagating signal. Waves are not sinusoidal, necessarily. There's something called a wave packet, or sometimes it's called a wave train, which might be a series of crests and troughs six or ten or a million, whatever, but it's not an infinite sinusoid going from the beginning of time to the end of time or the beginning of space to the end of space. We use sinusoidal waves to clarify, which are sometimes called plane waves. When you're in an infinite plane, we think of an infinite sinusoid, and that's a useful mathematical device but the, re the wave itself is not the sinusoidal part. That's a particular kind of wave to clarify a few ideas. And group velocity and phase speed are, so when you have a wave packet, the wave packet actually travels at a velocity called the group velocity. But the crests and troughs travel at a different speed, and it is not even a velocity. It is a speed, because it doesn't transform like a vector but it's the phase speed. So we'll see what that means when we get there. So signals propagate from place to place, but whether it's the crests and troughs that are propagating or this wave packet is the thing that's propagating, we're gonna need to get a little more precise about what that means. So waves at the beach are one kind of wave. Oceanographers call them surface gravity waves. Um, and the key distinction for surface gravity waves is they have a different relationship between the group velocity and phase speed when they're in deep water or when they're in shallow water. Then there are lots of flavors of surface gravity waves that you might have heard about. Rogue waves. <laughs> a rogue wave is a freak like statistical anomaly that has a very, very large crest. And it's typically a superposition of a lot of different waves all in one spot to make a really big one. Um, at waves at the beach are frequently breaking because they're moving into shallower water, which you call shoaling. So when you're going from deep water to shallow, it's shoaling. And because the phase velocity and group velocity and phase speed are changing as you're making coming on shore, the energy kind of piles up and gets tall. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. And then what might be familiar if you've taken physics and talked about optics are refraction and reflection. W waves do refract and do reflect. So if a wave hits, so there, where the wave was bouncing off the socket on the wall, it was reflecting off of the wall. So traveling one way, bouncing off the wall, coming back. Or in a bathtub, the waves go up and back and up and back. But refraction is when, so a good one to think of is when you're looking at a glass of water, you know, the angles all get funny because the light is getting bent by the interface. So waves in the ocean also get bent when something changes, like when they propagate from deep water into shallow water, they tend to change their direction. So that's refraction. Gosh, did you have a question? Can tides be considered as waves? Tides are definitely a kind of wave, and we're going to spend actually a whole day talking about tides. <laughs> yeah? <laughs>
So there are two, well, there are multiple different kinds of waves. So one kind of wave is called a longitudinal wave, and that's where the stuff goes. So if this is the propagation direction of the wave, that's where the stuff in the wave is going this way. And so a tide is sort of like that, and then it brings stuff in, and then it pulls it back out. A transverse wave goes this way, and it might not move at all in the direction of propagation. It goes like this. Um, and then there are other waves that don't have any material displacement at all, but they're just a communication of signal. So we'll see different flavors. But the key distinction is the propagation speed of the wave is not just taking a hunk of water and moving it. So like the Coriolis force that we're used to, that happens to anything that's moving on the Earth on a rotating sphere. A wave does not experience the Coriolis force based on its group velocity because the wave's not actually moving. It's not, it's a lot of different water that's moving and temporarily piling up over here and then it falls down and then now it piles up over here, but it's different water that's making the crest as the crest moves. The crest is not a fixed piece of water. It's a little misleading because breaking waves, when they are shoaling at the beach, actually do become a fixed hunk of water. So when we think about this, when we think of like waves at the beach, that is a big, like there's foam on the top and the foam hits you. Like it, it's, the foam is moving. But farther out, before the wave starts breaking, the wave is propagating more than the motion of the water underlying it. It's propagating through the water, not carrying the water. Does that make sense? That's sort of a subtle thinking, but we'll start to see. Oh, and then, um, there are two waves, or there are much different ways that we get surface gravity waves, but the classic one is wind waves. That's what most of the ones at the beach are. Somewhere, maybe not right on that beach, but somewhere else in the ocean, there was wind blowing on the surface and that made those waves. <laughs> and then they come to you. So their creation mechanism is wind. But then the other kind of wave that you frequently hear about is a tsunami, or more broadly a seismic wave, and that's where some kind of earthquake or landslide or something like that causes a, a, a solid earth process causes a wave in response. Or Chicxulub. The, have you guys heard about this enormous wave that like killed everything all over the world all in a matter of minutes or a matter of hours? So when the, the Chicxulub crater that killed the dinosaurs, they now have found traces of the wave propagating out of it and they have simulated the wave and it covers the whole world and it's like kilometers high and it goes around the whole earth. I mean, this crazy thing. <laughs> anyway, it's been in the news recently. Okay, so let's look at some other people's definitions of wave. So waves are not easy to define. That's one, one way to define them is to refuse to define them. But with them, uh, so he wrote this famous book about waves. And he defines a wave as a recognizable signal that's transferred from one part of a medium to another with recognizable velocity of propagation. So he doesn't even talk about anything else other than the fact that it has a recognizable velocity and that it exists in a medium. But in fact, you could disagree with him and say light doesn't have a medium, its medium is space-time. So even there, you probably have to loosen up a little, but there's some kind of velocity implied. That's an important. This is probably too broad and then corpus is a wrong range of dynamical systems as well as physical processes. Waves can occur in different media and take on many different forms. You have to think of waves as simple sinusoidal undulations, but that's too restricted and often not very useful. So this is a nice one. Waves are the means by which information is transmitted between two points in space and time without movement of the medium across the two points. So that's closer to the piece that I've been emphasizing. Okay, so some examples of waves. <laughs> <laughs> you guys know this quotation, this is one of my favorite favorites. So the wireless telegraph is not difficult to understand. The ordinary telegraph is like a very long cat. You pull a tail in New York and it meows in Los Angeles. The wireless is the same, only without the cat. <laughs> so I love it. And it's like, no, no, you're following totally until the end. <laughs> it's just the same, except there's no cat. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not clear that Einstein actually ever said that, but anyway, it's too good of a quote to miss to pass up. Anyway, surface water waves, waves of the beach, that's an example of wave. Um, many of the processes leading to El Nino, and we're going to talk specifically, we'll spend a day talking about El Nino, especially Rossby and Kelvin waves. So Rossby, you've been hearing about him. Kelvin is the temperature guy. These are 
geophysicists of the 19th century or early 20th century who studied the kinds of waves that happened in large scale ocean and atmospheric motions. Sound waves, another thing you can hear me because of, not just you have heard about, you are hearing them right now. Phone calls are kind of wave. They're a, an electrical wave in the wire. Radio is like, it's like phone call, but without the cat. <laughs> Epilepsy is a wave. It's a wave in the, it is a pathological uh, oscillation that sets up in the brain cells and it, and it tends to self-reinforce. Um, and, but it, mathematically, it has the same equations of motion as a wave, just in the equations of motion for neurons. Traffic jams are a wave. They tend to move upstream in terms of the direction of flow of traffic. So have you ever gotten into a traffic jam and then you get to the end and there's just nothing there? Like you can't figure out why everyone slows down? It's because once a traffic jam forms, it propagates backwards. So it propagates up the tra sense of flow. So frequently traffic jams are free form and they have been separated from their initial cause and now they're just propagating up the highway. The aurora borealis is a wave, a magneto hydrodynamic wave. Um, so lots of examples. One of my favorite examples, after this epilepsy one, so when I was getting my master's, I was working in computational neuroscience and one of the computational neuroscientists who was like very funny, his favorite example was if, if you pour water into a toilet, it flushes. And so he had this dream of getting a ring of toilets where you would flush one and when it flushed, it would dump water into the next one that would dump water into the next one. And so there the, the wave would just go around and around the toilets without, without end. Obviously, the toilets are not moving. <laughs> There's not. That's the sense in which it's a propagating signal with a fixed velocity and an underlying mechanism, but it's not necessarily like a sinusoid at all. So that, yeah, anyway. Okay, so we saw the inertial oscillations, and we watched this movie a lot of times, but we can watch it one more time and think about it. Okay, so those are surface gravity waves that you can see on the top. And now the inertial oscillation is something other than the surface gravity wave because when we zoom in, see, there it is right there, that wobble, wobble, and see how it's not as fast as the surface gravity waves. It actually has a lower period, and we know that the period is related to the rotation rate of the tank when we did the math, and we actually looked at some of the drifter records to see how that works too. Kind of see, so you can really see the inertial oscillation there, this tipping of the Taylor column back and forth. And that's kind of like a wave. It isn't propagating in our treatment of them. Although we know that probably in a tank it isn't, it probably does interact with the sidewalls of the tank somehow. So there's some kind of sense, sense in which it's propagating in that case. So let's remind ourselves of the math. So if we have an order one, temporal Rossby number and everything else we just set to zero in our equations of motion. These are the equations. So we have a U, V, V, U, and we can eliminate U by plugging this into that equation and we get a second derivative with respect to time of something that has four omega squared V. So a second derivative with respect to time equals that's something proportional to the same thing you can do with exponentials or sines and cosines. So the sines and cosines, so if I take the second derivative of this, I get four omega squared itself, which is what the equation up here would work out to be. DDT squared equals four omega squared minus four omega squared of itself, okay? And then this is kind of a funny kind of motion because like it's got Coriolis force involved the U's and V's are all tangled up together. We can't make this wave go in one direction because it's always kind of sloshing around in circles. So this is a rotating wave, but we have the sense that it's one piece of the story that's important is the DDTs are gonna be part of the story whenever we're talking about waves. 
we're not going to be able to throw away the DDTs entirely. And then the other part of the story is that we're going to look for something that's like, let me write out the equation. So, or I could have done MV. Does everybody see how you would get that from this? Just by substituting this u into there and then simplifying the equation. So this is a relationship between the rate of change and this, or I can think of this as, a, as an equation for the frequency. So the frequency here, the thing that goes in here, this multiplier of the time, so every time the time goes from z zero to one, this thing goes from zero to two omega. And every time this inside piece hits two pi, it resets, right? So this, as two omega times t goes from zero to two pi, my wave is recharging itself and coming back to the same phase, okay? So the frequency, is going the angular frequency that thing in this case is two omega, and the period is going to be two pi divided by two omega. So every time t little t reaches two pi divided by two omega the cosine reaches the same value that it was at t equals zero. So every two pi is gonna reset itself, okay? And we'll come back to these in a little bit, but this is gonna, all right. So they don't propagate, so are they waves? Do we think? What do we know? There's no motion of the underlying data line. Yeah. I don't know. There are oscillations. <laughs> it depends on what definition of wave you want. You don't have the wave state, like you don't satisfy the wave state. Well, so how far from a wave equation is this? That's part of the question. This is this is a time. So this is this is an oscillation equation, maybe rather than a wave equation. So you might want a partial differential equation which has both space and time in it to think of it as a wave. And you could certainly say that that was a definition of wave. It had to propagate with a Velocity. This doesn't have a velocity, it just has a frequency. So maybe it's not quite a wave, but it's wave-like, it's oscillating. There are other kinds of waves, which are superpositions of propagating waves, called standing waves, that also don't propagate, but we definitely think those are waves. So um, it's not so clear that propagation is a feature. But they do satisfy the wave equation. They do satisfy a but wave equation. That's true. Okay, so here's some more words about waves, which are useful as we're discussing, learning to discuss. So the wave is propagating like this. The distance from crest to crest or trough to trough, so crest to trough, is called the wavelength. And then in a surface gravity wave, you might have a still water level, and so the wave is either above or below the still water level. There's something called the orbital path, which as the wave propagates by, the water that makes it up actually goes around in little circles. And so the wave is going by, and the, but the water is just sitting in circles. And so the crest is not following. This little parcel of water at the top is going to go down, and then it's going to go against the direction of propagation of the wave at the same time that this one is rising up. So the crest is exchanging which water parcels it's on. The water parcels are following these little circular motions called the orbital path. The frequency, I said frequency this way, but if you sit still in space and watch the crests go by, that would be a pure oscillation of this sense. So then the frequency is the number of crests passing point A or point B at a second. So sit still in space and just count how many crests go by or how many troughs go by per unit time. That's the frequency. The period is 
2 pi over the frequency, so the time required for a wave crest at point A to reach point B is one way to do the period. So the crest propagates, that's a way to get the period, or the period is just how long does it take for that repeating frequency to occur? Sit at one place and just wait for it to come back. Okay. All right, let's watch a little movie. We actually use this movie for something else. This is kind of a wave movie, but we were using it to talk about invectives before. But <laughs> now we're going to talk about it as a wave process. So the little black dot is sitting still at a point in X. And so it's going up and down and inscribing the frequency of that wave. The wavelength is the distance from a crest to a crest or a trough to a trough. The period is, so the wavelength is L. Wavelength is lambda, which has units of space. Frequency, it has units of one per time. And there are two different kinds of frequency. There's the frequency, the angular frequency, which is what I talked about here. So that's the time it takes to go from zero to two pi. And it really has units of kind of radians per unit time. <laughs> it's convenient. But sometimes people talk about the physical frequency, and that they just mean how many cycles. So one trough to trough, crest to crest, how many cycles per unit time. And that, they differ by a factor of 2 pi. OK, and then the last one, C, is the phase speed, which has units of length over time. And then here's this funny equation. So this equation is really discussed as being very deep when you learn it in physics. We're talking about light waves, but it's not that deep. OK, what does it say? It says, in the amount of time to go from a, a crest to a crest, sitting still, the wave will have propagated a wavelength. So that's what it says. It says that the crests, the phase, the crests are propagating at such a speed such that it'll go one wavelength distance in one period of time. Or in the frequency is such that you go one wavelength every one over frequency so long. So wavelength times frequency is the speed. That's it. Does that make sense to everybody? So this is a nice relationship. You can almost do it by units. But we're going to see that that's not the only velocity that's important so when we get to it. OK, so what's an, so now let's get to an equation that tells us about wave. OK, so I claim that this is the most, this is the most basic wave equation. <laughs> this says. There's a wave in some property, eta. It could be surface height, which maybe makes sense because we're talking about surface gravity waves. But it could also be temperature. It could be salinity, whatever. It's a wave. It doesn't matter what the property is. But it, the wave has both a spatial, there's a spatial variation in this property and a temporal variation. And the wave equation hooks them together with a phase speed c. OK. This is the simplest equation. And you would say, oh, let's talk about this with sines and cosines. Let's do that. Let's see. So what kind of a what kind of a sine and cosine? I could say eta equals some amplitude times the sine of a frequency part plus a spatial part equal that's if I take that as my guess. What do I get if I plug it into that equation? What's d eta dt? Omega times cosine omega t plus kx is just equal to, well, I can't do it that way. Never mind. Um, so that's equal to d eta dt. Everybody see that? 
And what about the x derivative? It's the same thing except out here we get a k, right? Cosine of omega t plus kx dk dot. So how do I make, oops, x? How do I make these satisfy that wave equation? What do I have to do with omega and k and c? Yeah, so omega over k was c. Is that right? It's negative. Okay. Because if I have, if this is true, then this one, I can replace that k with oma minus omega over c and multiply it by c. This would cancel that one. Everybody can see that algebra. Okay, but actually I didn't have to have cosine here. I could have used an arbitrary function. And another arbitrary function here. And so in fact, any old arbitrary function you like by the chain rule, as long as it's a function only of x minus ct satisfies this equation. Okay, so we're used to sines and cosines, and we think, all right, our sinusoidal wave is moving along, and it has a frequency omega, it has a wave number, or one, 2 pi over wavelength k. But actually, I could have put any signal I like into this equation and it just would have moved along at a speed and speed. <laughs> Does that make sense to people? It's sort of a little, it's a little abstract. So if I put a crest in this function, so let's say it's zero everywhere except for one place it's got a crest in it. This solution says the crest just moves in time with speed c. As t, as t goes up, x has to go up with it, and the rate at which it goes is speed c. So we can make a diagram of this called the Hobbs-Muller diagram, which we will definitely want to talk a lot about. Time on this axis, space on this axis. Suppose my initial profile looks like this. Here's my one crest. Later in time, I'm going to find it like that. <laughs> And then later in time, I'm going to find it like that. And the rate, the slope of that line, C. Does that make sense? So that's what this says. The y-axis is T, yeah. So this is, I'm showing later and later in time my, my function which has this little blip in it that's moving this way. And really, this I, I shouldn't be drawing it like this. It should be contoured on this, but, uh, but um, you know, this is really a third dimension. It's the amplitude of the wave coming out this way. But I'm sorry, I've flattened it into the plane to make it make more sense. That slope is C. This slope from the crest to the crest to the crest is C. And C has units of rise over run, so it's got units of x over time. Okay. All right, so this is a little bit funny, though, because all the waves go to the right. <laughs> they don't ever go towards, they don't ever propagate the other way. They only propagate one way. So can we make a similar equation? It looks like this. And we can. This is the second most simple wave equation. And so this one has a rightward propagating wave where it's going towards plus, towards bigger and bigger values of x in time, and a leftward propagating wave where it's going towards smaller and smaller ones. And the nice way to think about that equation is actually to factor it into two other equations. So d by t v squared eta minus c squared d by dx of eta equals zero. 
I can actually write this as d by dt operator plus c d by dx operator times d by dt operator minus c d by dx operator operating on eta equals zero. So it's kind of like I multiplied the equation I had last time <laughs> times another one that looks the same except I reversed the sign of the propagation speed. I multiply those together and I get this combined equation. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's look at what a non-dispersive wave looks like. So this is a movie that I have made at great numerical expense using MATLAB <laughs> of a propagating non-dispersive wave. <laughs> I did not put the answer in. I think I'm actually solving. Oh, no, I'm not solving. I'm almost solving the equation. Sorry, and then there's a weird periodic boundary condition which makes it add up. <laughs> Ignore it when it gets to the boundary. But let's go back and watch it again. Okay, I start with a, with a triangle, and then by symmetry, half of my triangle goes one way, half goes the other way. I could have changed it by putting more conditions rather than just an initial anomaly. I could have said initial anomaly and rate of change. It's a second order differential equation, so I actually could have specified Oops. It's really a second order differential equation. Uh, <laughs> I could have specified an initial um, rate of change or something, but this just has stationary anomaly in whatever eta is. So eta is our surface height here. And so it doesn't have any reason to go to the right or to the left, so it goes to both in equal parts. And it's the shape doesn't change because that function eta eta plus and eta minus, they don't change in time. They're just the same function, but it gets translated. Does that make sense to everybody? OK, what about plane waves? So we talked about plane waves as being sines and cosines, and we just did an example with a sine wave. More generally, we could have done the full Fourier transform of eta. And eta had to be a function of that, you know, x minus ct, or since omega over k was c, we could just write it as kx minus omega t. So it's still a function of that kernel bit. Um, but then for different k's, I could put any eta I want. So I could have different wave numbers and my initial conditions and stick it into that formula. Or you could just look at this formula and say, I've just made the, I've, this, is, this is just the Fourier transform of this. Either the Fourier transform in x or the Fourier transform in time of the same object. Okay? So Fourier transform, remember, of signal. Wave number? Yeah, sorry, maybe, sorry, wave number is 2 pi over, so the same way that period is the frequency, if wavelength is what it is, then wave number is 2 pi over the wavelength. And the wave number, it's the number of waves per unit distance. So if you have a high wave number, you have a lot of crests. If you have a low wave number, you have few crests. The same way that the frequency is the number of periods per unit time. So this is the number of crests per unit time. OK? OK, so sorry, Fourier transform is just e to the i something times a variable, or e to, and so I can think of this as the x Fourier transform. Or I could have actually written this out and made it the time Fourier transform, and it would have been a kind of symmetric thing because the wave equation is sort of symmetric in the way it treats x and t. So I could have done it either way. But for now, let's think of it as the x Fourier transform. So I take some initial condition, like that little triangle, I Fourier transform it, and it goes into all kinds of different frequency, all kinds of different wave numbers. They all have a different amplitude and phase. And then, but I can make this guy satisfy this wave equation if each one of these 
satisfies this relationship. Which is another way of saying our original thing. This is the says the speed of the crest and troughs propagates at omega over k. And now it's squared because it could go either to the right or to the left. But that's the same thing. So if I Fourier transform this and every single Fourier component, which has an amplitude a of k and a phase a of k, this is, I should have said this is a complex amplitude. So I could have a, a sinusoid part and a cosine part inside this eta. All I have to do is guarantee that this is the, that to solve this equation, I just have to guarantee that for every k, the omega that goes in here is related by this equation. And then I get a solution for the whole mess of them all together to this equation. Okay, so this thing, a relationship between the frequency and the wave number is called a dispersion relation. And this is a silly one because this is the dispersion relation that doesn't disperse. This is the one when it says that omega squared is basically omega over k equals c and c is a constant. It means that all of the different waves, regardless of their wave number, regardless of their frequency, all propagate at the same speed c. So they all satisfy this equation, or it could be plus or minus c, but that's this is sort of the simplest case. Okay, and this is the, for non-dispersive waves like light, and as we will soon see, shallow water waves, this is all you need to know. But dispersive waves are gonna be different. Oh, and I will just give you guys, how many of you know your signs and exponents and complex bits? These are all of them. <laughs> this is everything you need to know, but just, the important one is that a complex exponential can be written as a cosine part and a sine part where the amplitude, the complex amplitude, the real part of the complex amplitude goes with the cosine part and the imaginary part of the complex amplitude goes with the sine part. And all of this can be derived from this formula which is for any delta, e to the i delta equals cosine of delta plus i sine delta. And so you can play these games and figure all this out. You can also do all of the trig relations this way. I greatly annoy my middle school and high school age children who are taking trigonometry by doing everything in complex exponentials instead of doing it the, with the rules they're memorizing. But anyway, this is, this is the bit that you, that you need to know if you wanna think about it if you prefer to think about it in sines and cosines versus e to the i's. I like it with the e to the i's because um, you don't have to keep track of which one is the positive one and which one is the negative one and whether the derivative with the cosine is sine or with minus sine. Or, and this makes it simpler to be in complex exponentials. But some people find it very confusing. Okay. Okay, so seeing that, so let's write, so if this is what all of our, this is what every component in that Fourier transform, they all looked like this. They had some amplitude, and they had either the ikx plus or minus ct, or kx, I could distribute k over here, and it would become an omega, because k times c is equal to omega in our little dispersion relation. So you might think of this as an amplitude part, and a phase part. So this is the complex amplitude, this is the complex phase, and so as we go from zero over to two pi, the phase is the thing that's going from zero to two pi. In space, it would be i k x that goes from 0 to 2 pi. So x is going from 0 to a wavelength, and k is 2 pi over wavelength. So the phase in the spatial bit is this, or we could just sit still at a location and say i k c t goes from 0 to 2 pi. So the phase sitting at a point in space and letting time go by would say that k 
ct goes from 0 to 2 pi, or that kc is omega, so omega is 2 pi over the period. So as the time goes from 0 to the period, kct or omega t goes from 0 to 2 pi. Okay? So the phase is the thing that goes from 0 to 2 pi, but you could either think of it as being a function of x or a function of time. They're interchangeable because of our dispersion relation that relates those two together. Okay, this thing is a complex number. You know, if I put eta equals one, doesn't matter what it is, then this has cosine of kx minus, plus or minus kt plus sine of i times sine. So this thing's a complex number. It is convenient to deal with the complex waveform but only the real part is the thing you're really measuring. So you're just keeping track of the imaginary part because it keeps you from screwing around with the sines and cosines. But the real part of this is the thing that you measure. Does that make sense? Okay, but so this is a generic relationship. This is a generic way of writing a plane wave. So it is infinite in X goes for all over all x values. It is infinite in time. It goes over all time values. And at least written like this, it's unchanging in x and time, aside from that oscillation that goes all the way out to infinity in both directions. OK. So here, I'm just writing out more about what if we think of the phase as being a function of time, because there's a period of 2 pi over this angular frequency or the real frequency which is the angular frequency over 2 pi. These are just some definitions of period, frequency, angular frequency to keep track of. Um, and this is the same as a wave number. So every time kx goes through an integer value of 2 pi, it repeats itself. So the wavelength is lambda which is 2 pi over k and k is called the wave number. Okay. And we've already seen this sign, so this is just coming back and giving us more of those. All right. And we got all this stuff. True frequency, the period, we don't even know where wavelength. Yeah, we've already gone through it. Okay. So if C is equal to omega over K, then this guy. If C doesn't depend on K, then the phase of every wave number has the same speed. So it doesn't matter what. For each one of these, they all have that speed C. Because K, so if I factor the K out, I just get X minus CT. So it's propagating with X minus CT. But I can easily imagine that I still define C to be omega over K, but what if omega is a more interesting function? It's not just a constant. What if omega is equal to K squared? Then C would be a function of K too. And that would say that different wave numbers would propagate at different speeds. Okay. And that is what is called a dispersive wave. So we saw that simple solution, the one where eta is just a function of x plus or minus ct. They didn't disperse. Didn't matter what function we put in for eta, it just propagated and maintains itself. But if I go through this exercise and I find that c is a function of k, then maybe the short waves, the high k waves, will propagate faster. Or maybe the long waves will propagate faster, but signals won't stay put. They're going to separate out. They're going to disperse in time. So we're going to, let's watch an example of a movie. OK, this is our non-dispersive wave. So whatever signal I put in, it just stays the same as it propagates. OK? This is an example and I, to highlight this. It started with a square initial signal rather than a triangular one. And you see these little trailing edges? I don't know if it's going to loop. Let's see if it loops. 
No, it doesn't move. All right, watch carefully. So as time goes on, these littler wiggles are getting left behind the bigger wiggles. So which one is propagating faster, the long wavelength or the short wavelength? The long wavelengths are getting out ahead of the short wavelengths. Or the small k's are getting out ahead of the big k's. So if I was going to plot <coughs> c versus k, it would go something like this. The small k's are going faster than the big k's. I don't know what slope it is or anything, but I can imagine that there is a function like that. And so if I write that relationship of C equals omega over K, then omega, if C is a decreasing function, it's probably the case that omega is also a function of K. So we're generalizing what we meant by a wave to allow them to have functional relationships, but that C equals omega over K piece is still holding. Okay. All right, so this is where we get to the notion of a group velocity versus a phase speed. So this is a picture of a wave packet, and it has six waves. No, I don't know. It has six waves in it to begin with. Does it always have six? One, two, three, four, five? One, two, three, four, five, six, yeah. But over time, in this example, the crest in the back is actually propagating faster than the group. So one wave appearing in the back overtakes the group and gets to the front later. So in this case, the phase, the crests and troughs, are propagating faster than the group. In this case, we didn't think of it so much, but actually this anomaly is really a group of lots of different Fourier modes. And the long waves are getting out to the front of the group, while the short waves are separating towards the back of the group. So in this case, the phase speed is sort of equal to the group speed or slower if you have very small waves. But here's an example where I've made it more explicit. So this is a <laughs> this is a crazy superposition. That's a wave packet. What kind of a wave is that? Is that dispersive or non-dispersive? Oh well, I've just said it in the title. Which one is it though anyway? Why is it non-dispersive? Its shape doesn't change over time. So it's got a crazy complicated shape, but it doesn't change. If I take this same initial condition and I put it in a dispersive wave equation, what do you expect to happen? It'll like spread out over time. It'll spread out over time. So that's what this is. That's the same initial condition. But now look, the long waves are moving out ahead of the short waves. And you actually see that this is really kind of a superposition of a wave packet of long waves, a wave packet of short waves. Make sense to everyone? So this is the dispersive case. Now watch for something else when it goes. Is the phase speed or the group velocity greater here? Not quite. Look a little, a little more closely. Oops, sorry, this is the non dispersive one. You're right about the big one. You can tell because, look, the crests are moving forwards. They're getting farther and farther towards the front of the packet. But back here, look, they're also moving faster than the packet. So in both cases, the phase speed is faster than the group velocity in this case. This happens to be a deep water wave dispersion relation. So this is what happens to waves in deep water. 
the way the crests at the back of a wave packet actually move toward the front of the wave packet as the wave packet propagates along. And it does it at a different rate depending on whether they're short waves or long waves. Long waves go faster than short waves. Okay? So, um, without going into the, a whole lot of detail about where this comes from, we can use this same formula and define a phase speed, or in this case, it's actually a phase velocity for deep water waves, but a phase speed where C is omega over K. So whatever the omega is, whatever K is, whatever C is, this gives us this propagation speed because that's what's just sitting inside of this phase operator. The phase is repeating itself every two pi, and if we put this relationship between x and ct, or kx and omega t, and that relationship holds, that will be how it prop goes from zero to two pi. The group velocity is the derivative of omega with respect to k. Okay. When will the group velocity equal the phase velocity? When does the derivative of omega equal omega over k? I don't know what happened. Linear relations. Hmm? Linear relations of omega. When there's a linear relationship between omega and k? Not a group of k. Or when? Omega over k equals some constant. So the point I'm about to make is if C equals omega over k and Cg equals d omega over dk, if Cg actually equals C, then that means d omega dk equals If CG equals C and C is not a function of K, then omega equals C times K and D omega DK equals C, which equals CG. <laughs> so if this is the case and C is not a function of k, then this. So let's what I so what I have shown is if I have this relationship for phase speed and c is not a function of k, so when I take the partial derivative of omega with respect to k, I just find c, then that means the group velocity equals the phase speed. And that means that, so if C, if the phase speed is not a function of K, then the group velocity equals the phase speed. And also the wave will be non-dispersive because all of the different Ks will propagate, all the different wavelengths will propagate with the same speed, okay? You also can get a non-dispersive wave for which this is not true. This isn't. This goes one way. This says, "Tell me that this is this relationship, and I'll show you that this one is equal to that." But you also can, sort of by coincidence, come up with other functions where that's the case. But we don't, don't have to deal with that for now. But the key idea is that phase propagating across the packet, starting at the back and going to the front, or starting at the front and going to the back, is intimately related to the idea that it's a dispersive wave. In a non-dispersive wave, the crests don't overtake the trough. Everybody just stays fixed as you propagate in space, no matter how complicated the shape is. So in our non-dispersive case, the way, reason this can keep its shape is because 
the crests are not overtaking and transforming the shape of the, of the function. Does that make sense? In this case, they are. OK. Um, sorry, this is just a, another example of how you can think about a, a, a wave train or, or a, a wave group as having an amplitude that's a function from some central point and then a carrier wave, which is the wiggly part on, underneath. OK. All right, why am I always trying to talk about phase speed rather than phase velocity? In the 2D case, this one is not a velocity. I'll, I'll explain to you why. So. Here's, a, here's some waves, and they're all propagating that way. And in that direction, we would have a wavelength. We'd have a frequency omega if we just sat still and watched the waves go by. And we could take their ratio, and we would get a phase speed propagating in that direction. But I could have also said, well, I've got a wavelength cutting along the x direction or I've got a wavelength cutting along the y direction. And I could just define a phase speed in that direction. I could say, as this crest moves along, as that wave's going that way, I could ask the speed at which that crest propagates along the x-axis. Is everyone on board with that? OK, and here's the mind-bending part. If this wave is propagating directly along the x-axis, then that propagation speed would be the same as the propagation speed of the wave perpendicular to its crests. But as the wave propagates farther and farther away, how does this, the speed of propagation along this axis change? Does it get smaller or does it get bigger? So imagine if the waves were really, really just having just a tiny bit of propagation here, a tiny bit of, of so it was going mostly this way. Think about the, the extension of that beam. It would go really fast because it would have to go all the way, however far it needs to get, for the next one to reset. So it actually gets larger as the direction of propagation of the wave goes away from the direction of the axis. So if it was a vector, the phase velocity, we would actually expect it to get smaller as we directed the direction of propagation away from the axis. So it would be as big as it can get when the wave was propagating along the axis, axis and smaller and smaller and smaller and zero when it was going that way. That's not what it, the phase speed does. The phase speed is smallest when the wave is propagating along the x-axis. And then as you go away, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and then it's infinite when it goes this way. So instead of the speed, instead of what we might expect if it was like a velocity, if you get something like c dotted into x hat be the be the vector, the x component of the speed, speed along the x-axis, or c cosine of theta, where theta is the angle between the x direction and the c direction, it's like this. So as the angle gets bigger, this thing, as the angle goes away, it goes the wrong way, essentially. So the reason why I'm careful to say phase, speed, group velocity, is that the propagation of a crest in a given direction, that transformation of phase in space to time, 
does not transform like a vector. It transforms like this. Okay? It's, in 1D, everything is fine, but in 2D, things get a little bonkers. Okay? What? You can have them both be, they're two different speeds. It doesn't matter whether they're both scalars in 1D, and they can be different from each other, but you don't have this problem that in different directions you get something that's very non vector like behavior. So here, the reason why I have a surfing movie, so this is pipeline in Hawaii. And so how fast is that surfer moving? As fast as the wave or faster than the wave? Yes, the surfer is taking advantage of the phase speed not being a vector. And to go faster, you don't go down wave, you go up or more along the wave. In order to keep up with the wave, you have to go faster and faster and faster along the wave. And so the way that they control their speed, to slow down, they go with the wave. And to speed up, they go into the wave. So riding pipeline, which is this long tube, the whole game is, is that the speed goes more. To go really, really fast, you want to run along the wave. And so there are only a few places in the world where the brake is good and pipeline is long. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's also a beautiful place to go. If you have a chance, it's a very nice place to go. <laughs> okay, so we need to be a little bit careful about group velocity and phase speed. They're not the same thing in dispersive waves. And that's why surfing works. It also leads to lots of interesting things, and it separates our waves by wavelength over time. So when you go to the beach, the swell that's coming in, these really long waves, are actually normally formed by storms on the other side of the ocean. And it has propagated a very, very long way so that the long part of that wave packet, which is like the size of the storm, moving away from the center of the storm, have gotten out front. And the swell is all you see. These guys have dissipated and done other things. So those big, long rollers are not from the local winds. They're from storms far away. And you see only the, long, the low, long wave, low frequency components. Yes? So as the um, <coughs> wave propagates up through the group, yeah. it changes its amplitude, right? Yeah, so this is another question. So the crest is changing its amplitude or its local amplitude but the group actually doesn't change its amplitude so much so the energy of a particular crest isn't localized in the crest the group is the transporter of the energy so even though that crest is getting taller and then getting smaller you might say oh it was more powerful in the middle and now it's weaker on the side there's the energy that's in the whole wave train is just is conserved. It's just spreading out as the wave train separates out. So it's not. Um, so this is part of why the wave is not a hunk of water that's moving with a given kinetic energy. It is definitely not. The wave is this complex of all of the different anomalies together. And the conservation law for energy over the packet actually dis redistributes the energy among the different crests and troughs, which is how you can go from small to big to small again, is because it's grabbing energy and concentrating it as it goes into that middle part and then comes back down. Yeah? There are two wheel packets, right? Yes. In the right direction. Yes. Yes, so in this case, what I've actually done is I've put, I've made an amplitude, an envelope function, and these actually have the same envelope function, and then I have two different carrier waves underneath. So that was the way I built the initial condition, but I could have put any number of them in there. This is just a nice one because the way that it separates it out makes it easy to understand. But even in that more complicated case with the random initial condition that was separating apart, that, um, that, has the same underlying dynamics 
It's just the Fourier components haven't fully separated apart yet. All right, we can do a, a whole lot of vector calculus on this and talk about where the group velocity comes from and why it's related. But essentially, the key story is that that amplitude function propagates with the group. And the crests and troughs propagate with the phase. So you put those two together, and you get the behavior of the whole packet. OK. So now we can talk about standing waves. <laughs> One little piece of magic. If you take a e to the i k x minus sigma t and add to it a e to the i minus k x minus sigma t, the k x bits become just cosine of k times x. And then this part just becomes sinusoidal in time alone. So if I take just the right waves propagating in opposite directions with the same amplitude but opposite propagation and add them together, I get something that's stationary in space and oscillates in time. So this is just that formula plotted. So this low point becomes a high point, becomes a low point, <laughs> high point, and this is the superposition of a wave propagating in that way and a wave propagating that way. When they add together is when you get a big amplitude, and when they, when this one's going up and this one's going down, they cancel out, and that gives you a small. So they add together and then they can cancel out. They add together and then they cancel out. Does that make sense? So this is an example of constructive and destructive interference. So when the amplitude of the standing wave is big, it's constructively interfering. And when the amplitude of the standing wave is small, they're destructively. So the crest is canceling a trough, or crest plus crest equals the, the big crest. Trough plus trough equals the small trough. So this is a simple case of the kind of thing that makes a rogue wave, except it's a additive over many, 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 many different waves all together to make a really big crest. OK, so we said the magic formula for this was understanding what um, relationships omega equals some function of k, or c equals some function of k for a dispersive wave. These are some examples from oceanography. So here is our unidirectional propagation equation, equation with, sorry, this is sigma, it's just omega. This is a grab, grab from a textbook that has different notation. C naught, so this is propagating with a uniform single velocity. This one now says it could propagate either right or left, because C could be positive or negative, just a square. Here's one that's two-dimensional propagation, but it could go in any direction in 2D. <laughs> which is a little bit crazy. Here's one that is now two-dimensional any direction, not a single direction, up or down. And then here is a really crazy one where it's now not even a, the function actually reverses direction so that the highest frequency occurs at the lowest k. So this one is actually the equation for Rossby waves. This is what, how, this is the kind of waves that support Clemenia. And we'll see how that where that comes from next time. <coughs> Let's see. Resonance. We'll talk more about resonance later. Okay. Let's look at. Uh, okay. So we we could also make a wave not in a kind of unidirectional sense, but we can make it in two D. And so this is a little model that I made that makes a wave by just putting like a plunger at the surface in the middle. And I just go up and down with a specified frequency and a specified plunger size. And um, so you can take a look. So what are some of the things you notice? So the, the phase of the wave is propagating out circularly from the plunger. It's going you know, plus, minus, plus, minus. The wave gets weaker or the crests and troughs get weaker as you go farther away because the wave is kind of spreading out in two dimensions now. It's not the farther away from the source, the less 
wave energy per unit circumference you have. So the circumference is getting bigger and bigger and bigger as you go away. So the amount of energy in the crests has to be decreasing as the circumference gets bigger. So the amount of energy escaping that plunger is the same. And then the last piece I want to point out from this is these little arrows are showing you the direction of the wave, the direction of the velocity that's making up this wave. And you probably can't see it, but they're rotating around and around. So what would you expect to happen if you make a plunger like that? All right, so you'd squish down and it would go away, and then you'd lift up and it would come in, and you'd go out and in and out and in. This one, I have the Coriolis force on. So when they go out, they actually rotate a little bit. And when they come in, they rotate a little bit. And so we can contemplate waves with the Coriolis force in them. And so instead of just having a DDT and then like a pressure gradient, we'd have DDT plus Coriolis plus pressure gradient. We can solve those kind of wave equations. And you get a little bit of coupling, because this is called an inertia gravity wave. So it's some part inertial oscillation, some part gravity wave. If we hit it just the inertial oscillation frequency, the response would just give us inertial oscillations. As it gets faster and faster, we're making a larger and larger advective Rossby number, essentially, and we start getting more and more DDT part, less and less Coriolis. So the amount of rotation, the blend of those two, has to do with the frequency related to the frequency of F. Okay? And then here's a really weird one. So now I put the plunger in a channel. Uh, this one doesn't have a lot of F. This is a non-rotating channel. So now you can see all this cool interaction with the boundaries. And as you go farther away, the waves are sort of filling up the channel. What do you think will happen if I put it in a, if I rotate the channel? <laughs> what happened when I, when I rotated this guy? I got, instead of just straight in and out, I kind of got little oscillations. So I'll probably get something sort of like that, right? All right, this is one of the weirdest results there is. <laughs> In a channel, you get waves that don't propagate symmetrically anymore. They propagate only with the wall on their right-hand side when you have F rotating like it does in the northern hemisphere. So this is a very peculiar <laughs> phenomenon. Um, and actually, so Brad Martha and, and colleagues in the physics department have just shown that this is actually an example of topological insulation. So um, you know, there's a Nobel Prize in the physics department from was it two years ago for topological insulation in quantum systems. This is a geophysical example of topological insulation. There's a symmetry broken by the rotation that makes waves now have this characteristic where they propagate anti -sym not symmetrically. And so there's all kinds of interesting pieces of this. This kind of wave is called a Kelvin wave. And so Kelvin actually discovered this kind of wave in the 1800s. But still, people are getting Nobel Prizes in physics for the underlying mathematics of this <laughs> in, you know, whatever, 2017. So this will be a big part of what we discuss because this sort of selective propagation one direction or the other is an important part of how the signals propagate around in the, in the oceans and how like tides propagate, how El Nino propagates, how weather systems propagate are all related to this kind of symmetry breaking due to the, the rotation of the Earth. So I know there's a lot of weird concepts. We're going to now go back um, and discuss different kinds of wave equations one at a time. Oh, here's another example. Now I put the plunger right up on the wall. And this is really weird. So watch the waves just go down the wall that way. <laughs> they don't go away. They just sneak off on the wall. 
is really weird. <laughs> it looks more like droplets than waves. But um, so for the next few days, we're gonna we're gonna be talking about different kinds of waves. Oh, here's another example. This is not a plunger. This is just a droplet in the middle. But this one is actually on the beta plane. And so if you watch closely, it's propagating slight. Oh, it doesn't do it. Oh, no, that one's not on the beta plane. Hold on. Hold on. I'm not explaining my waves right. Here we go. This, I've just dropped a big blob of water in the middle. And some waves run away, but then there's a high like sea surface height sitting there, and the arrows are all going around it. What's that? It's a geostrophic blob. So it's like the same dynamics as a gyre. We've got a high pressure anomaly in the middle. But I didn't, I don't have any walls or anything. I just dropped a blob of water. But I dropped the blob of water in a large enough domain that geostrophy comes into the response. So as that wave runs away, it sets up a circulate, uh, an anticyclonic circulation and holds the blob there. So it never goes away. The wave just sits there as a blob. And if I do that in a rotating channel, Here's my blob, it just sits there. But if it's on the beta plane, that blob eventually starts moving to the, <laughs> to the left or to the west afterward. So there's a lot of weird, strange symmetries that get broken by this rotating planet stuff that we're going to try and understand over time. OK? Oh, and I'm not going to talk about PV inversion. But anyway, OK, cool.